Ting, ting. We're making music on these. Got to sample that later. This is Computer Upgrade King again. We're back with an upgrade <coughs> for the Asus G703G. As you can see, this thing is ginormous. First thing you want to do is remove this panel. And the tools we're going to need today for this, well, actually, don't need your exacto. This was just for opening the box. But you will need a Phillips head, some plastic spudgers, and some little plastic guitar picks, you know. Weedle, weedle, weedle. And we're going to get into this right away. The first thing you're going to want to do is take off this removable panel here. For you guys at home, this is going to be the easiest way to just upgrade it. But since we're doing memory, we want to replace the sticks that uh, the customer can't get to easily. It's going to be essentially a full teardown, and eventually this whole panel will come off. I'm going to start here. So you come in here, there's one screw that secures this panel. It's literally just one screw that secures the whole panel. And then from there... I need to pop up. It's just a pain to get it. Give it a little. There we go. Let's see if we can get under. All right. Boom. Make sure you kind of keep everything together. There's going to be a lot of different screws. So now that we have it open, you can see a lot of stuff. This is going to be all the easy upgrade stuff for you guys at home. Unless you want to go all the way. Over here you have two MDME slots. 2280s. M.2s. And then you've got two additional RAM slots here, 2666, DDR4, SODIM, where you have, what is this, potentially 9.5 millimeter mounting, with how thick this thing is, and of course another NVMe slot over here. These two are going to be direct CPU <laughs> attached, so I think if you use Intel drives and you can braid them together, you can get crazy speeds, and over here you can fill out with a third drive and get even more ridiculous speeds out of it. You should start by removing everything that's in here. And then we're going to remove all the screws. It's going to be a process. So we'll start over here with this NVMe. Simple. Take out the screw. Pops up at a 30 degree angle. Done and done. Keep everything together. And we're going to remove this hard drive caddy here. It's going to be four screws. Hopefully they're all the same size. It'll make it a little easier to keep things all together. And according to the hard drive caddy here, it actually labels out what these are. M2 by 8 by 4. Yeah, and they are indeed all the same. This comes right out. How thick this is, this is definitely a 9.5, which is nice. It means you can put a nice fat drive in there and save a little money. Or you can put a 2 terabyte or something crazy. And we're going to remove this little heat sink over here. That's for the M.2s. Again, it looks like four screws. Yep, four screws, all the same length. This pops right out. You can see that on the bottom of this, it has a thermal transfer pad. You're definitely going to want that when you're putting two MEMEs together. It's going to be hot. Keep again, keep those screws together. And now we're going to start removing every other screw, which is a lot. So we've got four here along the front. And we're going to hope and hope and hope that Asus used all the same size screws. All right. For now, I'm going to lay these out in a grid because I don't know if they're all the same size. And we're going to continue around here. I'm going to take out all these screws around the edge first. We're still the same size, which is going to be nice and convenient. Oh, that's unfortunate. This isn't long enough, so we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to put that in there and get it seated, and then we're going to turn it. There you go. you got to be resourceful sometimes, right? Looks like these are going to be the same way, potentially. No, they're not. Just barely two. And you'll have this a lot, where you turn a screw, it's all the way out. And then it sticks in the hole for whatever reason. And you just can't get it out until you take the panel off. Regardless, that screw is undone. And we've got the same thing with the screw, where it's fully undone, but it's not coming out. So annoying. So far, so good. Everything appears to be the same size. Yeah. Same size. And these are all actually labeled, so these are all the same size that I'm taking out from the center here as well, it looks like. I guess this might have done as a solid here. Yeah. All the 
the same size in the center. These are unscrewed. I just can't get them out. There's no screws on the back that are going to come out. And I'll go ahead and assume that that's all the screws we're going to be taking out of this thing. And let's start popping it out. So I'm going to take this, start with a spudger, a little guitar pick. Run that along your edges. Nice and easy. Okay, okay. Something's not coming free over here. Let's see if we gotta give it a little love. There we go, there we go, there we go. We did it. Now that we're here, first thing we're gonna do is remove this battery. And it looks like it's all unscrewed except for one. And the battery's gonna come right out. I'm going to put that right back in the screw hole which is actually actually marked for you that's good so there's a little triangle that marks the one screw that comes out with this so keep that together and what it appears is that this whole thing is going to be a board flip which is a super huge pain well that's why we're gonna do it instead of asking the customer to do it ribbon cables for days first thing I'm gonna do then is go ahead and remove this Wi-Fi connection over here Boom. And this kind of like runs through the fan housing over here. We're gonna go ahead and take these fans out. They pretty much always need to come out. Looks like we're still pulling out the same size screws. I'm gonna get these cables out of the way. Looks like the speaker cable also runs through here. So we'll go ahead and move, move that as well. here at the other fan so it looks like the first thing we're gonna do is just unplug the fan itself I'm gonna unplug this fan over here as well totally left it plugged in <laughs> all right and then we're gonna move over to the other side here I'm gonna unplug some cables we got right here the cable for your screen that runs through this fan housing I'm gonna get that out of the way unplug the fan and we'll go ahead and remove these securing screws for the fan oh, there we go nice long screw nice long screw again it really appears like they've kept it the same throughout the entire laptop you'll realize that there's like tape kind of like make sure the air goes through each of these individual little heat sinks here that being said we don't really want to mess that up so what we're gonna do is actually remove the entire heat sink assembly and that'll actually make everything easier anyway. So if you look at the heat sinks themselves, you'll see that they're numbered one, two, three, four, and then they want you to hop over here. Where's five? Oh, five, six, seven, eight. What we have again here, this is your GPU. This is your CPU. You can tell because there's a much more robust cooling solution on this side. It's covering up all your memory chips and all that business over here. I just like to follow the numbers. You're going to follow the numbers either direction, whether you're taking it on or off. Does it really matter for when you're taking it off? Not really. Not really, but it will help when you're putting it on to spread the paste evenly. Definitely keep all these screws together. Finally, you come to a different size screw. to be the same size which is actually fairly unusual most of the time they like to switch up on the screws here so I'm glad they didn't so let me ask you something hmm. we've seen a bunch of comparisons between laptops that have the i9 and ones that have the 10 set or 8700 mm -hmm. and the 8700 usually kicks its butt okay. why wouldn't a manufacturer like this put the 8700 instead Oh, you mean like desktop instead of soldered on? This is going to be a lower power solution, so this is probably 35 to 40 <laughs> watts. Whereas your desktop solution is going to be 65 watts, so it would require an even more robust cooling solution. Especially when you're going to have, well, pointing at the GPU, but CPU is here. So you would have to have essentially this same size cooling solution over here in order to handle that kind of power. This is going to be much easier to cool than it would be if you were to put a desktop solution in there. And let's say you put you know a desktop processor in there too then you need more copper to cool that 
and it just makes the laptop heavier and heavier. There's pretty much no end to it when you get to that point. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and try and get this whole heatsink solution to pop off here. It's gonna be difficult. We've got thermal pads. Gotta make sure everything's kind of out of the way here. Yeah, let that go through, let that go through. And they use thermal paste on like everything. So we'll clean this up later here. We're gonna have to put it back together anyway, and when we're putting it back together, we're gonna put some new thermal paste and stuff on here. And for now, we're gonna get this stuff out of the way. Boom, get this out of the way. Boom, so I was wrong about this. This is not your screen connection. This is probably your front panel stuff. Maybe like all the LEDs that are running along here to make it all fancy. This is actually your screen here. And hopefully I don't break it. Boom. Those blocks next to the GPU? These guys here? Yeah, is that still part of the GPU? Yeah, so this is your memory chips here. These are like your VRMs and your chokes and stuff like that. This is all for like power delivery. And this is your actual memory chips here. And then this here is obviously the GPU die itself. And over here you have the CPU by itself. And again, it's got its own little set of like VRMs and chokes uh, to smooth out power. I mean, if you were to put a desktop solution on here, you'd have to have a full socket so we're talking this much more space to begin with, right? So you've already kind of doubled your surface area. As you can tell, there's like a million little cables that are coming in this thing. So we're gonna just slowly but surely undo all these. Power button, that's nice, it's labeled for you. What we got here? Keyboard lighting, all right, all right. And this is your actual keyboard connection. Everybody's gotta have these fancy RGB things, so. And we come up here to the front again. This is more like LEDs up here on the front and this connection here. What is this? This is your trackpad. Boom. Ugh. These are your buttons for your trackpad. You got speakers. Unplug your speakers. It's like a serious pain. Boom. And our speaker here ran over to the speaker, so that was running like in serial, so we're good. Is there anything else that needs to be unplugged before we start taking out screws? You were excited for that snacks part? Uh, no. I hate board flips. <laughs> They're the worst. <laughs> if you look around on the motherboard here, you can actually see that every screw we're going to take out has this little triangle next to it, this little white triangle. Kind of lets you know that like, hey man, this screw hole is populated, which is nice. But thanks for that, Asus. So we're gonna remove one screw and two screws. And three screws. So many screws in the back here. And these power connections are and stuff like that. That's all of our motherboard screws. So it looks like they've made it so you can pull up from this side here. Nice, 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 nice. Look at that. All that, two RAM slots. And why not put it on the other side? These limitations, right? Where on this side do you think we could put another two sticks? You know what I mean? What goes there? Is that not RAM? This is RAM right here. Why yeah. don't they? And if you look at the back side, it actually lines up exactly where, where this is. So why don't they put on. the main RAM stick <laughs> on that side so you don't have to flip it if you want to upgrade? I'm sure their idea and or reasoning behind it is that these on the back here are accessible from this easy access plate, uh -huh. this plate that you remove. Right. So for your average end user, you would just add more RAM into these slots. Correct. And that makes it easy for you at oh, home to, to upgrade. Both. The problem is, is that they ship with one RAM stick, which means you're in single channel mode at any given time. So let's say you add two sticks to the other side. You now have three sticks, you know? So you're, you're still, still in single. <laughs> you're still in single, you know? It's like they didn't think this through is all there was to it. Especially in a system like this, desktop replacement, we're talking thousands of dollars as it is. To go through all this effort just to enable dual channel on a system that should already be enabled from the factory is pretty crazy to me. But anyway, so what we're gonna do here is just remove this stick. Again, same thing that we do on every RAM stick. Both of these little clips are gonna come out of the way. Ting, ting. Make music on these, gotta sample that later. Comes up at a 30 degree angle, it just pulls right out. And what we're gonna put in its place it's two 16s, 2666, and we want them to be matching, so we're gonna put in new ones. Even though it's Samsung to Samsung, replace both of them. Boom. So that entire process was just to put two stick and RAM in it. Pretty cool, right? So anyway, now we're doing that, and we're gonna do that here in-house, obviously, because that's gonna make it easier for an end user. You wanna go from 32 to 64, 
all you're gonna have to do is pop off that back plate and you're gonna be ready to go. So we're gonna put this back in now. You can see that these connections on the back here actually need to be slotted. These on the side here are good. These on the side here are also good. So the only thing that's important is slotting your back connections. Do you see any benefit in going from 2666 to 3200? To 3200? I guess it's kind of changing, right? Back in the day, it really wasn't that huge, you know? But it seems like now there's more and more things that are actually giving you an advantage for having faster memory, especially if you were to go AMD. AMD is really sensitive to memory speeds. What am I doing wrong here? Apparently I'm doing something wrong here. Why is this not sitting down? Like I want it to sit down. So typically like GPU memory, like these chips here are stupid fast. They're like five, 6,000 megahertz or whatever. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. They could potentially even be more than that. Potentially up to like 12,000 or some stupid absurd number. So if you're running slow memory on something like that, where your GPU actually is going to be using your system memory as its source of memory, that's significantly slower than these chips. Significantly slower. So the fastest you can make that, the better. Is that always going to be the case? Will you get better performance if you have faster memory? Yes, you will. I mean, it's as simple as that. Is it going to be this mind-blowing thing where you're like all of a sudden getting 20 frames a second more? Probably not. It's more for people who are doing super fast calculations or people who are doing a bunch of small files, you know, stuff like that. It's very much so for your average home user you never know the difference. Memory is so expensive right now. Well, it's, I guess it's coming down, but it's uh, still very expensive. You know, you start buying those kits of three and 4,000 megahertz memory. There's 4,000? Yeah, yeah. I think, what is it, G-Skill or something like that? It has a kit that's like 4,600. And those, those kits are stupid expensive. I mean, if you want to get like a 32 gig kit of 8 gig, it's probably like, you know, 600 bucks or something crazy. I'm not fact checking this as I'm speaking. More or less, you're going to pay quite a bit. You're not really getting the performance per dollar in most scenarios. So we're going to focus on things that are huge performance gainers, you know what I mean? We're going to focus on, of course, getting you from 8 to 16 gigs first, right? Because you're running Windows 10, you're going to run Chrome, and everybody knows that Chrome destroys memory. And everybody now wants to multitask, you know, you want to have like Spotify open and stuff like that. So we're going <laughs> to, you know. Wow, that's an example of multitasking. <laughs> well, no. I mean, in all reality, what are you going to do? I'm talking about multitasking when gaming, right? Oh, right, right. You know, in particular. Maybe and now we have YouTube like, video you know, with the, with the rise of streaming, you've got yeah. people that are running like a million different programs in the background. You might even be streaming yourself. Yeah. OBS. Exactly. So... More memory is what we focus on first. More memory doesn't necessarily make the system faster. It only makes it faster if you need it. It's really as simple as that. If you're not utilizing all the memory in your system, then putting more memory in your system does not make it faster. Do you think 16 should be the new base instead of 8? It, it seems like nowadays, at least for like anybody who's a gamer, 16 should be the new base. You know, between Windows 10, between having Chrome open, I know a lot of people for some reason are like, obsessed with using YouTube as their music source. And mm. I don't understand that, but that's another conversation. Essentially, yeah, Chrome is just a memory hog, first and foremost. And like I said, if you're getting into things and you're OBS and all that stuff, you're streaming on top of that, or you have a second monitor and you've got your Discord up and you've got links to whatever you're doing up and all that stuff, I mean, you're gonna be eating some memory. So definitely recommended 16. Uh, I haven't really been talking as I've been going along here because we were discussing other things, but we have put all the motherboard screws back in. Uh, we put up the screen connection over here, and then we're gonna just move along. At this point, we're ready to put the sky back on. But before we do that, we're gonna clean off all this. We're gonna need a little space to do that with. Don't waste paper towels, people. You don't need to use an entire paper towel to clean this. The only thing that we're going to clean on this is going to be the two surfaces that are going to contact the CPU and the GPU. So these two copper plates here in the middle, we're going to clean this off, we're going to clean that off. First and foremost, this is old and like caked on, and who knows? It's Pretty much every manufacturer uses trash thermal paste. There, there is no other way to put it. It's always bad. Never leave it. Let's say like, if you were to put more thermal paste on top of this, now you've just created First of all, you've got two different chemical compounds that are trying to work together. And second, you've got multiple layers that now has to pass through. 
So it's going to be much less efficient than it would be. So the whole purpose of thermal paste is just to fill in the gaps, essentially, right? If you had perfectly even surfaces on everything, you wouldn't need thermal paste theoretically. But that's never the case. And even if you, by your eyesight, you're like, that looks pretty perfect, it's not. And it reminds me of that one episode of Rick and Morty <laughs> where he thought he had made a level surface. He didn't. Morty was like, I'm gonna use this little like bubble leveler and I leveled these shelves. And Rick tells him, hey man, that's not perfectly level. He makes it perfectly level. And Morty steps on the surface. The next thing you know, he goes crazy because you've never really felt a level surface, a perfectly level surface. What kind of performance gains could you expect from going from the cheapo manufacturer thermal so, paste to a good quality one? I guess saying performance gains is not always the right way to put it. It really depends, right? If you're not overheating, then you're not gonna see performance gains. If you're overheating and you change the thermal paste and all of a sudden you're no longer overheating, then yeah, you're gonna see some serious performance gains because things will be able to max out. But generally speaking, temperature-wise, usually overstock thermal paste, I mean, you're looking at anywhere from five to 10 Celsius, generally speaking, overstock thermal paste, just by putting like some decent aftermarket stuff on there. So I guess the problem here is that they don't have configurator options, you know what I mean, on their websites. They sell these things like as is, off the shelf. So in their mind, it's sufficient for the laptop. But that's sufficient, say, in all perfect scenarios, right? It's like 72 Fahrenheit in the room that you're operating it in, and it's got a perfect gap under it. There's no like felt, or there's no like somebody has it on a blanket, which always happens. You're never supposed to block the vents on the bottom or on the back. That happens all the time. It's not real world scenarios. They're like, don't use these things on beds because the comforter is going to block all your ports and the next thing you know, it's going to overheat, which is true. But I mean, that's why they actually changed it. That's why they refer to them as notebooks now and not laptops because they don't want you to put it in your lap. It will literally scar you. It will burn you. It gets that hot. Why they don't put better thermal paste on it is simply because in their perfect testing scenarios and how they intend for you to use the notebook, it's sufficient. But it just doesn't account for all these other scenarios that can come up and happen in the real world. So now that we've cleaned off these two surfaces, we're going to follow up. Uh, we're only using 70% isopropyl. Some people want to use 91 or whatever. 70 is perfectly fine. And we're going to get it all off of there. Trying to remove as much as you can of the original. Is there anything to keep in mind while doing that? Not really, I guess. I guess it would be different depending on scenarios. But you'll see that these actually have like a film that covers the rest of the chip. So only the die is exposed. Mm. So in this scenario, you don't need to be but so careful about removing it. But generally speaking, you would want to remove all thermal paste from the top of the chip because there are other connections. And thermal paste, depending on the manufacturer, could possibly conduct. Just make sure when you're putting thermal paste on here, you only put it on the die, which is this like shiny mirror reflection part here, right in the center of each of the chips. Hit it with some alcohol. Squeak, squeak, squeak. You can actually see here on the GPU where they originally secured the heatsink, the stock thermal paste, and it actually did squish underneath this pad. And you can see that there's a bunch of little like resistors along the top here. The yellow? Yeah, yeah. So whatever thermal paste we're using here is not going to be conductive. You know what I mean? It, it, that's how you know. The laptop is fully functional. Anyway, now that that's done and cleaned up, we're going to go ahead and put some thermal paste on these chips. We use Arctic Silver 5 here in-house, which is pretty famous. Anybody who's been around the PC industry for a long time is very familiar with this. And we're just going to put a little dab right in the middle. A little bit of dab right in the middle. Typically, on like full-size processors, uh, so let's say like a desktop solution, consumer solution, so like an 8700K or something like that. What I was told by Intel back in the day here is that you would do a line up the middle that's perpendicular, and essentially that's because the cores are split evenly between those two points. Right, so theoretically speaking, doing that, you get an even spread across the cores and you get better thermal conduction or whatever it may be. For these, you can see, like this is the only die you're looking at, this is the only die you're looking at. Rice-sized grain is usually what people recommend. 
what I'm actually going to do beforehand is hook up these little connections over here that are kind of covered up when you put on that uh, heat sink solution there. So it's going to be your power button. Boom. What other connections do we have? We got our speaker connection over here. And we're gonna get our LEDs done here. They've also kind of gone under the board a little bit. Boom, and we got one more over here as well. So you've got your LED bar here on the front. How come they don't have like one giant wire that feeds through that you just connect to the motherboard <laughs> that includes all the other connections in it? Well, on simple laptops, that might be what you find. Um, but on this laptop, you've got so many different components that they put in to make one laptop. So you've got wires from this LED bar up here, you've got wires from your trackpad. These are all from different vendors, you know? It's like not mm. Asus didn't necessarily design this laptop ground up. You mm. know? They're mm. using a trackpad that's already existed, most likely. And everybody has a different standard, you know? You've got these wireless connections and stuff like that that have to go specifically into the wireless card because it's not built into the motherboard and stuff like that. I mean, there's probably a more elegant solution, but until somebody starts doing everything, all the R&D involved, and making all the cool features of a laptop function, then probably never gonna happen. If anybody would do it, it'd probably be like Apple or I was something. gonna say, isn't Apple kind of in that, where they yeah. have Apple, a lot of the in-house? Apple doesn't really care about price. <laughs> I'm sure most of it, anybody has noticed. Apple's super expensive because all their industrial design work and stuff like that, and they do a lot of in-house stuff. Somebody's gotta pay for that R&D. Even though somebody's paying for that R&D, they're still making plenty of money, right? I mean, they've got more money laying around than like any other company. So, <laughs> they're making plenty, that's for sure. I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna pull this all through here. Try to line it up as best as I can before I drop it in. We've officially dropped it in. And at this point, we're gonna go ahead and secure these fans. And we're gonna secure this fan. The left fan only has the one screw, and the right fan has two screws. Two screws. And now that that's done, we're gonna feed these wires back through, so. Hook it up to the speaker connection, which is now a pain to get at. And then we're going to feed these Wi-Fi wires into this little track over here. Go one wire at a time, it'll make it a lot easier on me. It sure did make it a lot easier on me. And we're going to feed these under. And feed this wire through here. I'm going to go ahead and hook this fan back up. This wire is getting in my way. But with this one hour tear down just to... <laughs> yeah switch out the RAM, Yeah, you'd say this is a bit excessive for your average consumer? I would think so. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess that's kind of, hopefully the video will help you a little bit here. It should help you if you do end up doing something like this. I mean, it's definitely not recommended that you're going to be doing something like this at home. But this is where it'd be better to get from a system integrator like us. The recommendation, uh, as you can see, it's like if, if we break it, it's our problem, right? If you break it, it's your problem and it's $3,000. So, <laughs> I, I definitely wouldn't recommend, if you're, especially if you're not comfortable, if you haven't like gone into a laptop before, or I guess you're not confident in your knowledge and stuff like that, I, I don't know. When would be the breaking point for when I would be like, okay, this person seems like they're perfectly capable. And in the end of it all, it's really not overly difficult. It's just you gotta be careful about breaking stuff. So I'm gonna line up these Wi-Fi cables and connect them. This actually will be easier. They've given this like little rubber track over here. Hopefully it's gonna help me more than it's gonna hurt me. Props for this little rubber thing over here. Gotta feed these cables in. That has made it so much easier to just line it up and tap it down. Awesome. That was possibly the easiest it's ever been. So anyway, we're going to move back over here to the other side. I'm going to plug this fan back in. Get that wire out of the way. I'm going to run this front panel connection here. Calling the front panel connection like it's a desktop. It's not a desktop. But you get the point. 
from all those like buttons at the top of the laptop keyboard and stuff like that any LEDs that are on the top of the laptop keyboard that show off some sort of information for the end user we're pretty much at a point where everything needs to go back together so at this point the battery has to go back in we're done touching components you know, we're not going to be doing any other upgrades on this this laptop's going to go back together now boom remember there's a triangle anytime you need to put the screw in there when you have it apart if there's no triangle it means there's not a screw that goes there you know what i have forgotten this entire time guys that's funny is we actually haven't secured this heat sink at all <laughs> in the middle so get ahead of yourself you know again there's a pattern you're going to fall one two three four go catty corner and remember as you like tap these things down here with the screws all that's happening under this here is that thermal paste is squishing out I know a lot of people specifically with laptops like to do the spread you know they'll spread it over the die before they put it together does it really make a difference most of the time I would say no like 99.9% .9 of the time if I was getting crazy and let's say it was like a, a custom build and we wanted to like overclock and all that stuff I would make sure everything is perfect as it can be but 99.9% .9 of the time there's almost no difference between just putting like a dab of thermal paste on there and then just securing it like you're supposed to versus spreading it so in the end of it all there's a million different techniques for applying thermal paste and they're all basically almost equivalent people will argue and argue about what's the best way to do this but generally speaking they're all pretty much the same like as long as it's spread when you put it on, it's going to be just as good as anything else. And now we're at a point where we're going to put the plastic shell back on the bottom. Flip it in place. Nice and easy. And then we're going to put everything back in. So we took out this NVMe M.2 drive earlier. That's going to go in this slot over here. That goes in a 30, 45 degree angle. And then you press it down and you secure it with this screw. Hopefully you kept your screws together with everything that you took screws out of. And we're gonna put this back in. If you remember, it goes in like so. And we've got our screws over here. And last but not least, we've got this like M.2 heat sink shield that goes over here. Now, before you put this panel on the bottom, Make sure you put your screws back in these points here. You've got them all laid out. It doesn't really matter. They're all the same size. These four locations here. And then we're putting the rest of the screws. Nope. Oh. Can't remember this is not long enough. So we're gonna do a little. And then we're gonna just hold it in place and continue to screw. And we'll do the same thing over here. Last but not least, the panel. Looks like it, yeah, it does seat specifically here. Bottom first. And just tap it in place. Doo -doo -doo. These things always feel like they're not going to go in. I don't like that. Boom. And last but not least, the final screw. And a little rubber piece just goes back in. Boom. And that concludes the upgrade of the ASUS G703G. That is the easiest, <laughs> right? So let's let's give this a seven on the difficulty. Seven out of ten.